If you are going through some really big challenges in life, if you're facing some monumental problems, you're gonna love my guest on this episode of Unbeatable. Clint Callahan describes what he calls the avalanche effect. How a small change, like a snowflake, gathers with other small changes in your life, and pretty soon they become a snowball, which becomes a boulder, which just causes the whole side of the hill to look different because of some small incremental changes in your life. Hang on, you're gonna love my guest, Clint Callahan, on this episode of Unbeatable. These stories of triumph over adversity will help you handle your toughest days in life and become unbeatable. Part of the reason we're able to do this broadcast today is because of my friends at the Solomon Foundation. If you're out there and you're looking for something to invest in, these folks help the local church grow. And when you partner with them, they're going to give you an excellent return on your investment, but they're also going to help you make an internal impact at the same time. You want to know more? Just go check them out at thesolomonfoundation.org. Now here's my discussion with the social worker, therapist, and small change expert, Clint Keller. Hey, Clint, thanks for taking some time out of a busy schedule to be with me on this episode of Unbeatable. Thank you for having me here, Jeff. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about your world today. You're helping people sure. get their lives back under control. You do social work right now. Can you describe mm -hmm. a little bit about what you're doing right now? Sure. I've been a therapist and a social worker for the last 23 years, and I just started a life coaching program because I wanted to reach out and I wanted to help more people with the skills that I learned through my own life of all the, you know, all the stuff that's gone on in my own life, the trauma and the pain and the frustration and things and how I had to learn how to make small impacts and small changes every day in order to make a big impact in my life. And that was one of the most important things that I've learned is that it didn't take, you know, the big three day, 24 hour, massive intensive to make the change. It was the small and steady 15 minutes a day being very mindful and grounded with very practical tools to make those changes every day to make me become who I wanted to be. It took me about 38 years to get to that point where I actually liked and loved myself again. Yeah. And it was one of the hardest and most frustrating things is that being stuck that long for 38 years in just not liking who you are on a daily basis is one of the, was it was the most frustrating and depressing and sad part of my whole life. But we'll get more into that because I'll tell you all about my story. I was going to say, if you got there in 38 <laughs> years, you probably beat me and a whole lot of other people to it. So there's a lot of people right now that are saying, yep, I know exactly what he's talking about. Why social work? Like, what was it in the beginning sure. that caused you to start looking into this? Because everyone knows this is a hard yeah. profession with the, yep. the rewards financial rewards are not worth the, yeah. the work in social work. So what prompted you in the first place? Uh, my mom, actually, she, uh, my mom was basically an unlicensed social worker growing up and my dad was an engineer. So I got the heart and the, the head part of stuff pretty good and balanced there. Thanks to the two of them. Uh, my mom go, was mom an unlicensed social yeah. worker. Way to go. Yeah. Yeah. She got an unlicensed, she's an unlicensed social worker. She Worked at like the uh, the local orphanage. She started Emotions Anonymous, which is kind of an emotional self support group using the AA framework. She worked for Lutheran Social Services. She did all those kind of things throughout the course of her life, and so that was really my role model was her was being present for other people and meeting them where they're at, and that began my love affair with just understanding why people do what they do, and then. So when I was born, I weighed one pound, 15 ounces. So I was, this was 47 years ago. So technically I wasn't supposed to be here because my mom was going to go to her family farm the next day. So March 11th, yeah. I was born on March 10th. She was supposed to go to her family farm. If she would have gone there, if I would have waited two days, I yeah. wouldn't be here right now. So there was that piece. And then I went to school and in elementary school, junior high and high school for me was being bullied where individually with friends, it was nice and calm and fun and good. But when the friends got together, the group thing took over yeah. and I became the target of a lot of bullying. And that is where my fascination with psychology really began to bloom because why was it individually they were my friends, but as a group, 
they were my tormentors. One of my best friends that I've now known for 40 plus years was also one of my biggest tormentors. And it took him getting tormented in the early years of college to really realize wow. what he did yeah, and apologize to me. And we've been friends ever since, oh, right? Man. It's that kind of thing where you never know where life is going to lead because we hadn't been friends for two years before we went off to college. Yeah. So it was those kind of things. And now I've known him for 41 years. So I've known him for a long time. Anybody who's watching you right now on the YouTube channel can mm -hmm. see you're a normal, healthy, looks like, you know, relatively fit and strong guy. You were born <laughs> at one pound and seven ounces. That kind yep. of very, very small, tiny birth weight. Many babies yeah. are not going to survive that. No. And I learned that. I learned that because my mom actually had a journal where she talked about how hard it was for them for the first four months because they didn't know I was going to live or die on an hourly daily basis. Wow. When was it that you started to get healthy enough as a baby that they weren't mm -hmm. concerned that they were going to lose you? Uh, it took six months. Yeah. So I was in, I was in the NICU for six months, had pneumonia three different times. Uh, they had to do two different, they had to do a heart surgery and they tried to do some experimental treatments that my body rejected, which for other babies that didn't reject it, it actually ended up killing them because they were, because this was, 47 years ago, they were trying everything they could to keep me alive. And it was one of those things that when you hear that stuff, it's like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. And like, for me, I'm like, I don't remember it. I was a baby. You know, I, that was, <laughs> yeah. you know I yeah, yeah, it was crazy. Maybe the only thing do, I know is like, I, don't. I got, I got this right here, yeah. you know, and I, I can't really hear well out of one ear and that's pretty much all I got. And for most, most babies that were born as micro preemies, they didn't, they weren't as lucky as me. I'm completely functional in all ways. And for a lot of them, they're, they come out blind. They have current respiratory issues, you know, walking, talking, all the, all the things were yeah. impaired. So I got really, really, I beat the odds in pretty much every way. And I know that. And that's a piece of my story because that's what I was told for yeah. the big part of the first part of my life before I went to school was I'm a miracle. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be as healthy and happy and all the stuff as I am. And so, you know, when you tell a kid that, it gives them this sense of, oh, well, I must be here for a purpose. I must yeah. be here for a reason, right? And so then I went into school and it was not at all like it was at home. <laughs> it was bullying it and like it, tormenting yeah. and all these things to the point where I developed anxiety, severe anxiety, depression, people pleasing, I, and, you know, and those kind of things happen. Is that's what it developed into. I got, I had so much anxiety growing up, which I now know. At the time, I just thought I was sick a lot as a kid, but no, yeah. it was anxiety. I had physical somatic symptoms of anxiety as a kid to where I missed like probably months, months of school over the course of a school year because I was so sick with just the anxiety of having to go to school because I didn't want to be bullied anymore. And so, but then also that created anger issues and all these things because I didn't have control over my own life. And so mm -hmm. the anger issues then got me, got my parents to go, okay, you need to go to therapy because this is not natural. So I started, so I went to my first therapy appointment when I was 12 years old. And that therapy was the beginning of me going, huh, there's, wait a minute, there, there's ways you can fix this. There's, there's names for the reason why I'm feeling this way. There's, huh, that's really interesting. And so the engineering part of my, my brain that uh -huh. my dad gave me, he's like, oh, well, there's formulas and solutions and ways to make this work. And so that's when I got really interested in becoming a social worker and a therapist because I went through that and this therapist helped me transition and change and become that kind of the person became a much better child, was a much better teenager than I was when I was a, than a younger kid, which is usually the opposite. And so you go through there and I got through that and it was, it was amazing. It was life changing. When you pointed just a moment ago to that thing right there, you were pointing on your neck. And had you not pointed that yeah. out, I'm watching, I'm looking at you right mm -hmm. now. I would have never noticed. Yeah. But now that you point at it, yeah, you've got a scar on your neck and you've got a couple of yep. physical indicators of just how yep. how delicate your first six months were. But man, you yeah. said something just a second ago that really got my attention. It takes a really intuitive or a very aware teenager to recognize. Mm -hmm. These friends of mine, and I'm putting air quotes around the mm -hmm. word friends, yeah. are nice yeah. to me when we're in private, but in public with other people, they turn. Clint, 
10,000, and this number is probably a, uh, mm -hmm. it's probably low, 10,000 teenagers yeah. will kill themselves because of bullying every year. Mm -hmm. The fact that you were able to grow up strong, grow up healthy, mm -hmm. grow up helping people in spite of your background mm -hmm. is amazing. Mm -hmm. But I'd love to know, how is it that you were able to identify something that a lot of us it, that were bullied and there's plenty of people watching or listening that probably yeah. went through some bullying themselves, but didn't make the connection like what's what they're doing in public is not what they do to me in private. What was it yeah. that started you noticing stuff like that? It was therapy because the, my therapist would keep asking me, because the thing about therapy is if you do therapy, right, you're not just asking about what's happening up here. You're asking about what's going on in your environment. Who are the people in your life? How are they treating you? What's going on? Is there stuff at home? Is there stuff at school? Where is the stuff coming from that is creating this anxiety and this stuff? Right. Is it just in here or is it coming from outside sources into here? And so they, I mean, I didn't want to go to therapy. I was like any kid. I was 12 years old. I didn't want to talk yeah, about it. I didn't want to right? believe it was sure. going on. It was embarrassing. It was all the things. I didn't know how to express my emotions. I didn't know really what emotions were. I figured I had two emotions. I was happy and I was angry and that was it. And <laughs> happiness was less. Happy and, and angry. Was That's more. it. My whole life yeah. in two yeah. emotions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Those were my emotions. I mean, mostly it was angry. And so it was that kind of thing. And so by going through therapy at such a young age, they were able to kind of keep poking and picking and prodding until and teaching me the different words for what emotions I was yeah. feeling to where I was able to begin to put this together. And a part of that is because I think it's the engineering brain of that my that my dad kind of helped instill in me is, oh, this is a math equation. So if I'm feeling frustrated, disrespected, and and angry, then that must mean that this is why I'm feeling this way, because yeah. these things are adding up to make this big feeling. And so by doing that and teaching me those skills, I was able to go, oh, I see this now. They're behaving this way because if they don't, then they're the target next. And they and I recognize that now at the time it kind of made sense, but now when I look back, I'm like, oh, I get it 100. percent You know, hindsight's 2010, right? It's not even 2020. It's hawk vision. <laughs> right. You can see it perfectly, and that's the piece: is that as you continue to grow and if you can move through and get through those tough times and you get a better perspective, you always have a choice. You can choose to let it continue to be an anchor that drags you and holds you back or drags you down, or you can let it go and you can recognize it for what it is, as this is a learning experience that I can now use to push off and make steps to get to the next place I want to be. And so from that, I went and I decided I wanted to become a therapist. Well, the first thing I wanted to do actually was I wanted to become an FBI behavioral profiler and I wanted to catch serial killers. But then I realized that they wouldn't let me because one, I couldn't hear good out of one ear and I had really bad feet. So, <laughs> so it was those kind of things like, well, I guess I got to figure out something else to do. So then I chose to go into social work. And when I got into social work, the thing I loved about it most was the first thing they taught me, one of the first classes was the person and environment model, which is what was done for me when I was a kid. Yeah. And when that clicked in, I was like, oh, this is where it came from. This is why they were asking me about my friends and school and home and what my parents did and how I felt about this and what was going on outside of the home and inside of the home and all these different ways to try to build this model of here's me. These are all the attachments that are feeding into me and making me me. And once I realized that, I'm like, this is it for me. This is what I have to do because I can teach other people this because I've been through this. This was the best thing ever. This thing changed my life. And that began the process of me. So I got my master's degree. I got my bachelor's degree. And then I got my master's degree in 11 months. And then I, and I was working in a maximum security prison while I was doing my master's degree. I would not recommend what? working in a maximum security prison and getting your master's degree in 11 months. It will burn you out faster than you ever know. So, <laughs> so that that's what I was doing uh, for that. And I learned so much working in a maximum security prison because Talk about a slice of yeah. America that yeah. is completely yeah. outside of America. Well, I want to ask you, you're 
did your parents recognize, hey, Clint is sad or he's angry or he's happy and that's it? Was that what made yeah. mom and dad say, we need to get you some help? The reason I'm saying that yeah. is because there are some parents that are listening to this broadcast right now and they're saying, Clint, mm -hmm. it sounds like you're describing my son or my daughter to a T right mm -hmm. now. I don't want them to turn mm -hmm. to sleeping pills or a pistol one yeah. day. I want to mm -hmm. make sure that we help get them some help. But what was it yeah. that mom and dad saw in you that said, you know what, this isn't going in the right direction. This could get really bad. Let's make sure you get some help now while you still can. So what my parents noticed in me was that I stuffed. I was very calm yeah. and then boom, very calm and then boom. But the problem was, is that being very calm and then blowing up, the fuse gets shorter and shorter and shorter oh, and shorter. Oh, you're talking about so a then lot of people right it, now. Yeah. And so then it got to the point where one morning my sister would move her cereal bowl and I blew up. And my mom was like, okay, all she did was not move her cereal bowl in like three seconds when you asked her. There's something wrong. And I was isolating more. I was going more into video games. I was going more into reading comic yeah. books. I was going more into just reading yeah. books. I was isolating from, more. I was staying in my you. room. I yeah. was withdrawing. I was denying that I wanted to go to school. When I went to school, I did everything I could to keep my head down, to stay away, to do all these things. I did the bare minimum. My grades started to slip. All the things started to happen. And they were finally like, okay, Number one, we know you're smarter than this. What's going on? I don't want to go to school. Why don't you want to go to school? I don't want to tell you why I don't want to school, yeah. go to school. Why don't you want to tell us why you don't want to go to school? Because I don't want to get people in trouble. Because there was still that fierce loyalty for my right. friend group, right? right? Where I didn't want anyone to get in trouble, even though I knew what they were doing made me feel horrible. But I didn't want to get them in trouble. So I was fiercely loyal, even though it was damaging to me which yeah. is very common because what happens in high school, right? You're trying to figure out your tribe. You're trying to figure out your place. It is literally law of the jungle in high school. And if you don't have a tribe, then you're an outcast. And if you have an outcast, everything inside of your body is telling you you're an outcast and you're going to die because that's from 185,000 plus years of biological evolution. And in high school, we are all at 400% of the hormones to make us become adults. And those, so that's why everything is life and death in high school. And yeah. you look back on it now and you're like, none of that stuff really mattered. Right. But at the time it was the thing. And without, and that was the piece is they watched me retreating and withdrawing and denying and all these things. And they were like, this is not him. This is not who he is. Because when he's calm, when he's good, and of course, you know, you throw in the people pleasing and the anxiety and the depression on top of it. I didn't want a, them to know that anything was wrong. For disaster. Oh yeah, they were busy. They had stuff going on. I didn't want them to feel like any that they were doing anything wrong. I wanted to make sure I was doing the right thing. That I was doing good. That I was being good. That I was all the things right. But on the inside, I was basically dying inside. And so if it wasn't for them to get me to go to therapy and to get me to put words to these things, to put emotions to these things, to show me the formula and a path of what to do, because the first thing my therapist told me to do was something that I didn't, I never thought I would do. I'm like, she's like, I want you to journal. And I'm like, I'm not going to keep a diary. I'm a boy. <laughs> Boys don't keep diaries. Boys don't do diaries. That's a girl thing. Wait, that's yeah, what that's a 12 a girl year old boy thing. would say. Of course. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. And she's like, it's not a diary. It's a journal. Well, what am I supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to write down what you're feeling. Well, that's a diary, you know? And so I fought with them about that for probably about two to three months where I wouldn't do it. So finally, what they did is they go, okay, here's what we're going to do. So they gave me worksheets of just faces, like smiling, sad, happy, angry, just the different faces. And he said, okay, I want you to, so he gives me seven of those. Just circle what you're doing on each day, how you're feeling on each day. Just start with that. I'm like, oh, I can do that. Okay. So I just started doing the circling each day to do that, to kind of, you know, and then, and then I, and then it worked because then the next day, then the next day I was like, well, I'm kind of a combination of this and this. And then the next day, well, actually I'm a combination of this one and this one and this one. And so then I began to see this pattern of, oh, it's not just one thing. They all link together. It's not just happy and angry. 
it's all these it's these mm-hmm. different combinations of things because now I'm recognizing what those are. And so it's those pieces that as you continue to put a name to the stuff, as you continue to recognize that there's layers to feelings, you're now able to take that step back and go, huh, well, if there's layers to feelings, then maybe that means I can do something about it too. And so they gradually got me into that. And then I eventually started journaling and journaling is really, I think, the thing that changed my life and saved my life because I could then pull the story out of here and I could see it. Yeah. Take it out of your head and put it on paper, right? Because once you see, and now of course, now I understand the science behind it, of course, because it's one of the things I preach to everybody, journal, 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 because doing that, when I pulled that story out of my head and the way they told me to do it is don't edit, just dump, right? Whatever you're thinking, whatever you're feeling, they go, they said, we don't care if the first page is like all swear words, just <laughs> do whatever you got to do to begin to get it out, write it down. And so, you know, in the beginning, yeah, the first page really was a lot of swear words. I made some really creative ones. I was really proud of myself. You invented then, some words that didn't exist before. I invented that's some stuff. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Because that's how I was feeling. And then it eventually morphed into this person did this. This person did this. I felt this way when this person did this. And I started making those connections to where then I could actually begin to write a story about this is what happened to me. This is how it, what it did to me. This is how small it made me feel. This is how bad it made me feel. This is how confused it made me feel. This is how all these things made me feel to the point of where I didn't want to go to school. This is why, and I now understand why for me, when I get anxious, my stomach gets super upset Uh to the point of where like IBS upset, where it's like that. And I recognize now that that's what was going on with me through most of elementary school and junior high Uh is I got so anxious that I would literally got created IBS for myself. Wow. And it's those kind of things that as you, recognize these things and learn these things, you allow yourself to then actually have empathy for yourself. Mm -hmm. That's one of the main things that they taught me is I'm never going to be perfect. I'm not going to be able to predict ever what anybody else wants from me. I am never going to be able to do that. All I can do is my best with each interaction that I have and try to be me to the best of my ability. And the thing is, is not everybody's going to like you, Yeah, but that's not your job to make them like you. If they don't like you, that's a them problem, not a you problem. Those are the things that I got out of therapy at such a young age. There's a lot. That's why I was able to move through that process and be able to go, this is what I want to do for people. And so going through all that, then I started... And a yeah. lot of friends that are nodding their head saying, man, a lot of what you're saying describes somebody that I know, somebody that I love, somebody that I'm very close to. Uh, we talk yeah. about mental health help mm-hmm. a lot around here. Just because of the nature of this podcast, we are discussing mm-hmm. people's, some of their greatest struggles and worst trauma in life. And what's beautiful is that all different walks of life, all different experiences, a lot of people needed some outside help that you're describing, some professional Mm -hmm. help to get through it emotionally and mentally. But I think you're the first person, Clint, that's ever described it as a math formula. I love Mm -hmm. your analogy. (laughs) Really what a mental health professional is doing is trying to help somebody solve for X. There is a thing going on inside your emotions, Mm -hmm. the event and the the circumstances mm-hmm. created this thing and you're trying to mm-hmm. solve for X like an algebra equation to figure out yep. what is causing these, what is causing these feelings inside of me. I think that's a yep. brilliant way of describing it, which tells me you're a pretty competent social worker and therapist, <laughs> but I know a little bit about your story, Clint. Um, yeah. So, so you, you, my, my you favorite, did the so master's the equation thing. Yeah, you did so the master's the degree thing, while right? you're working yeah. at a maximum security mm-hmm. uh, facility in 11 months, yeah. like setting records, but there's stress <laughs> that goes along with it. And what I want yes. people to hear for just a few moments is what yeah. life was like early on when you were going through intense stress and facing burnout. And now as a professional, yeah. 
in this really traumatic environment that led to you yep. making a simple change that transformed your life. Mm -hmm. Can you just describe that period of your life for us? Yeah. So going through, so going, so we're getting a master's degree in 11 months is basically like them. So basically it's a two year program that they did in 11 months. So it's basically like they pulled, peeled open my skull and opened it up and just took a Put bunch a of books and started cramming them, cramming them all into my head. And, you know, working in maximum security prison, what I learned is the only reason why I only worked there for a year was because the world got dark really, really fast. Mm -hmm. I acclimated to prison life like in two weeks because there it is not the real world. It's 24 seven, 365. Watch your back. They're trying to get you to do things for them that is not, that is not legal in while they're in prison. Mm -hmm. And so that was constant stress of, don't screw up there because if you screw up there, you don't get to complete your degree. And if you don't get to complete your degree, well, then you don't get to move on with the rest of your life. So it was a double whammy of stress. And plus, I moved halfway across the country. And so I was isolated and alone mm -hmm. by myself, living in a, in a single apartment, going to, you know, didn't have any time for friends or for anybody. So that first year was isolation. And it, I became more depressed again. I had to go on Prozac again. I actually had to go on Wellbutrin. I went on Wellbutrin for the first time and I was on that for five years because I became profoundly depressed mm -hmm. realizing that the people that we were letting back out into society were going to reoffend and come back because they were so institutionalized that they, they didn't have any other way of living their life. And so that began that process of depression and so brought that back. I then left and I went to California. I lived in California and met my wife there and a lot of happy times for about the first five years. And then my mom got sick. She ended up getting um, an autoimmune disorder called dermatomyositis, which basically turned her joints and her ligaments into jello in the space of about wow. a year. So that she was in terrible. chronic pain every day. And it ended up in her ultimately committing suicide after three years. Oh, and no, man. For me, I'm the hardest so part of that story is... The hardest part of that story for me is that I was with her two weeks before at a pain clinic. I told all the doctors and nurses there. She sat down. The first thing she told me when I got there was we went to dinner that first night and she told me exactly how she was going to do it, how she was feeling, what she was going to do, all the ways that she was going to, that she was going to do it. So me being a good social worker and a good therapist, also having just got done working in a locked psychiatric hospital with people that were acutely suicidal for the last two years. So I knew what I was talking about. I went and talked to her doctor. I went and talked to her nurse, her psychiatrist, all that stuff with her present, told them exactly what, what they said, what my mom was saying. And they told me, no, she's going to be fine. She just has to complete the program. I said, no, you're not listening to me. To the point where I became belligerent and my mom had to tell me, leave. You do not get to talk to them that way, leave. Because I was like, no, either. but mom, they're not listening. They don't understand. She's like, no, you have to leave. This is my treatment. You have to leave. And I didn't, I didn't remember that for the longest time that mm. she told me to leave. And so two weeks later, she ended up killing herself. And that was, so that sent me into a major grief spiral. I burned out of being a social worker. I couldn't do it for about, about four years. I became a real estate agent and I started a company where I was helping nonprofits, uh, for-profit companies create nonprofit companies. So I was still doing some social worky stuff because I knew all about all that stuff. And then the 2008 market collapsed. Yeah. So I lost all my real estate stuff oh, I was doing. Man. Then we had to move in with my in-laws, with my wife and our newborn baby who had just been born three months earlier. And I was every place I didn't want to be. I was disconnected. I was depressed. I was anxious. I was completely fried in all areas of my life. And I just felt like nothing I was doing was working and that I just wanted to give up. But I had to stop. And I heard that the thing that changed was when my son was born, it, it, the, the switches in my brain that make me a father kicked in. And now I was like, oh, no, I'm responsible for this little right, being. Yeah. I need to get it together. I need to figure out the kind of man I want to be, the kind of husband I want to be, the kind of father I want to be. I need to figure this out. And so I began 
going back to one of the best things that ever happened to me was I had to take a comparative religion class when I was getting my master's. And so one of the ways that I coped was I started practicing Buddhism. And so I went and saw Buddhist teachers and I did meditation and I started mindfulness practices and those things. And I lost those after my mom passed. And so I got back into that. That was the first step on my journey was I started just being more present again. I started trying to reconnect with my wife and her parents and my son and myself again. And then from there, I began to journal again, to pull out the story that my brain kept telling me of, you're no good, you're an imposter, no one's going to believe you, yeah. all the kind of yeah. things. And it was through that and beginning that process again, I began to take all these little tools that I've been using and learning over the course of my career up to that point and building this system for myself, which I've now turned into this life coaching program that I've created is this is the thing that worked for me. I'm not saying I have the answer. I have some answers, but I don't have the answer, but I have some. All I'm trying to do is to get people to understand that when I started to make those small changes, my life began to transform within about two weeks. And then it just snowballed from there. I started seeing little things because I allowed myself to recognize the wins. Because that's the things that we yeah. don't do yeah. as people. Oh, if, if you recognize you're winning, then that means you're being conceited. That means you're that means you're tooting your own horn. You can't do that. And my wins were so baseline. Like today, I connected with my son and actually held him and didn't feel like fire ants were crawling under my skin. That was a win. Wow. Today, I actually sat and had a 15 minute conversation with my wife, and I didn't and I didn't say bad things about myself once. Wow. That was a win. So these weren't the kind of wins that you'd scream from the rooftops. These were those private things that we often do, but we don't think about. We don't recognize. And so by being more present through meditation and through journaling, I began to then change the way I journaled from, woe is me. Oh, my life is so bad. Look at all the bad stuff that happened to me was, look at the good stuff I did today. Right. Look at the small changes that I've made today. Look at the ways that I've improved my life, that I've improved my connection with my son, my connection with my wife, my connection with myself. Look at the small ways that I did this and look at how much I, I enjoyed myself. I enjoy my son. I enjoy my life again. And it was those processes that let me to finally break out of that. And it took me a long time to do that because I spent, I spent about three or four years being completely depressed and spinning. And then I spent another two years of trying to rebuild everything. Mm -hmm. So that's about six years. And then I spent another eight years just doing this practice every single day. And the thing about this is, did I do it every day? No, I built in failure. I gave myself three days a month where I could just say, nope, not going to do it. Nope. I'm just going to fail today. Failure's fine. Don't feel like doing it. I just, I'm just going to take a day off. I'm taking a mental health day from my mental health. And that's okay. <laughs> that's the I thing. Is because by yeah. doing that, it gave me the ability to recognize that even in failure, whatever that is in those moments, I could stop and I could breathe. And then eventually, now I have three, I still do my same practice that I've been doing now for about the last six years where I meditate for three minutes in the morning and I journal for two. And then I meditate for three minutes at lunchtime, and then I journal for two, and then I do the same thing at dinner time, uh, after dinner, before bed, to give me guardrails throughout my day. I do my intentions in the morning of what of the two things I want to get from the day, and I've narrowed it down to two things. And the crazy thing is, the two things I use, the same two things I've used every day. I have two goals now. I used to have hundreds of goals of what my life's going to be. I now have two. And the two goals that I live by every day is when I'm with people in my personal and professional life? Am I present? Or am I worried about tomorrow? Or am I worried about the past? That am I being question. present? Yeah. That is my professional goal that I follow every day. And my, you know, that, and my personal, and my, so that's my personal goal and professional goal combined that I follow every day. But my professional goal for my daily work is if I see a flicker, a little light bulb moment for anyone that I work with, and it's, Notice I say, if I see it, I yeah. didn't say it's if other people see it. If I see the flicker, then I know that I've begun 
to make change in that person's life and to keep focusing on the flicker for them. And that would makes it that's what makes me feel fulfilled professionally. And the thing about the the flicker is is I'm lucky that I'm in a profession where I get to see between seven to ten people a day that I get to effectively yeah. talk just like this to them to make them go, huh. So what you're telling me is I don't have to stay stuck up to my neck in this stuff that I don't like. No, you don't have to. You can move forward. You can push through it. This is how. Let's talk about how. What's going on in your life? What can we remove? What can we add? What can we do to get you to move? Because that's the thing. Therapy, life coaching, any of those kind of things is an intensely personal journey yeah. and you need someone that right. can personalize it for you so that you can see it for yourself. Does that mean that the group stuff doesn't help? No, the group stuff. I love the group stuff because when two or more people arrive, you're in a group, yeah. but you having that interaction gives you the ability to go, Oh, I'm not alone. Oh, you mean that thought that I had in my head, you've had it too. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah. Right. <laughs> wow. Wow. Oh, that's so, oh, that's so good. I thought it was just me because that's the thing. As much as I love technology and I've been playing with stuff since I was seven, I love technology. It also is extremely isolating Yeah. because we can get stuck in echo chambers. We can get stuck in these different ways that allow us to stay stuck. And it is frustrating when you see that because being stuck is horrible. I've been there. I've been stuck for years and it's the worst feeling ever because you know you are. Some people that are listening right now are stuck. One of the reasons I wanted to interview you is because you talk really openly about stress and burnout. Mm -hmm. And a mm -hmm. lot of people, very hardworking people that are actually doing a lot of good stuff at work or mm -hmm. in their communities, they're so overwhelmed by their life, but that, that they start to go through a burnout like you did. It affects mm -hmm. them personally. It affects their health. It affects, it affects their relationships with their family and yeah. their friends. It affects everybody. But I just picked up on something from you that I don't hear from other, a lot of other people, Clint. Often when people are really upset and frustrated with their life, they tend to blame mm -hmm. everything and everyone around them. And let's just be honest. Mm -hmm. Sure, the stuff and the people around sure. you are contributing to that. It's easy to mm -hmm. point the finger at everyone or everything around you. But you mm -hmm. said you took a moment and decided, what kind of man do I want to be? What do I want mm -hmm. my life to look at, look like? And that's a moment where you look at you, not everyone mm -hmm. or everything around you. So with the few minutes that we have left, I want people to hear mm -hmm. from you how you made this small change that led mm -hmm. to a big impact. And what you do today is help people do this 1% mm -hmm. of your day different that ends up being mm -hmm. a huge influence over your life. Can you describe a small change, big impact for them? The first, so, so small changes, big impact, where that came from is, it basically came down to when you're feeling burned out and like you're failing in those different areas of your life and you want to make that change, the key is you have to, I had to focus on for me, renovating those four main areas of life. I had to figure out what am I doing with my time? Am I wasting it? Because we can waste our time so easily because oh, there's a billion yeah. different yeah. distractions that want to take our time. I had to figure out what, how did I want to connect with people? Was I connecting with people effectively? Was I using my time and my connections together effectively? I had to learn to manage my emotions, which means I had to be, I basically, when I started this, when I started back up again, I went back to that worksheet that the first therapist gave me and I just started circling the ways I was feeling. You went again all the way back to 12 such, years old. How about all that? All the way back, all the way back to 12 year old me. I had to start that up again. And then I also had to figure out what is my purpose? Because purpose is the engine that drives us. And it's the thing that gets so broken down because Let's face it, we're horrible at maintaining what our purpose is. Yeah, so absolutely. that's what I that's what I've done with small changes, big impact. Is I've taken all that stuff that I've learned and I've and I'm teaching people how to take accountability and how to use and learn proper psychological, clinically defined tools so that you can use them to make 
those changes every day in those four areas of your life in just 15 minutes so that you can make your life unrecognizable in the next 100 days. And the reason why I do that is because I want people to understand that it really is 15 minutes a day. So every so my course is there's me talking like this on videos. Every video is less than 15 minutes except for one. Every worksheet takes less than 15 minutes to do. And it's you can do it in 100 days or you can do it up to six months because that's how much time I give everybody to do this. Uh -huh. And you'll be talking with me twice a week in person to discuss your questions in a group setting so you can hear from other people and get that information to know that you're not alone. And so if people are really tired of feeling stuck and burned out and just exhausted, call me. You, here's where you can find me. You can find me at smallchangesbigimpact.net backslash info. On that website, there's a 20-minute training that I did on burnout, or there's a link where you can set up a 30-minute call to just ask me questions, to just talk to me, because you need to understand that that you don't know what you don't know yeah. until you figure it out. Right. You can also find me on Facebook and Instagram at smallchangesbigimpact dot the number four and then the letter U. And I post content there of like two to three minute videos of me just talking about this stuff that I have stuck in my head from being a therapist for All 23 right. years. Is I've got lots of stuff stuck up here. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so I'm just putting it out there in the void to see what sure. happens. But what I want you to know is Everything that you've seen here, this is the me you're going to get because yeah. it took me 47 years to love me. It took me a long time and I'm still working on that. I still have my anxieties and frustrations and irritations like everybody else. But every day I keep working on loving me because if I don't love me and I don't care about me, how can anybody else? Because if you don't own it, you can't fix it. That is the one thing I've learned in my life is that you have to own what your part in anything is. Because if you don't own it, you can't fix it. That'd be like, you know, me taking your car and trying to sell it. It's not mine. How can I sell it? But that's what we try to do every day. We try to say, everybody else did this thing to me. Right. Instead of saying, what was my part? What can I control? What can I change? And if you can do those things and begin just that process, if you use just those three things for your journaling every night, you'll begin to see a shift in how you view you in reality. Yeah. Real quickly, before I let you go, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people yeah. that are sitting there thinking right now, everything that you're saying, I want that, Clint, but my mm -hmm. problems are so big. How yeah. are small changes really going to tackle my really big problems because they're so big, I don't even know where to start. Yeah. We used to have a phrase yeah. that my buddies and I would say while I was in the army. And I think yeah. I, I was thinking about you uh, when you were describing this. I was thinking about that phrase when people asked, how do you eat an elephant? Well, you eat an elephant yep. one bite at a time. So would you, for just the last moment or two, would you describe for somebody how 15 minutes a day over the next 100 mm -hmm. days can make those small changes, can really tackle their big problem that to them right now feels like it's so overwhelming, nothing can fix that problem. Would you talk to that person for just a second? Yes. The only way that you can begin to make change is first you have to own the fact that you need to make a change. Then you have to figure out what is an entry point that you feel comfortable starting with. For some people, it's just starting a daily routine in the morning and in the evening to create yourself a floor and a ceiling for your day. For other people, it's just waking up on time every day. For other people, it's changing how much water they drink in a day. It's whatever the entry point is to begin to make the change is the thing, because this is the thing. Small changes is an avalanche effect. How does an avalanche yeah, get created? Well, it takes one snowflake. Going down a hill, right? yeah. One snowflake. That gathers two, that gathers three, that gathers four. Now you have a hundred. Now you got a little ball, so on and so forth all the way down. So you begin with the thing that is the most low hanging fruit you can think of, of how to begin that change process. And then that's the thing. If you call me and we have a half hour discussion, guess what I'll do before the end of it? I will say, this is the most low hanging fruit that I see 
just start with this. Even if all you start with is just doing what I do, spend three minutes in the morning sitting and thinking about what you'd like to get from the day and then writing down one thing that you'd like to get from the day, just doing that. And then checking in with yourself at lunch or just checking with yourself in the evening, did I do that? And then you do that, that will at least start to clarify this because the story in here is reality. The perception we have is reality. So the only way to make real lasting change is to slowly shift your perception so that you can finally break out of the process that you're stuck in. And that's the best way I know how to do it is you have to get it out of here. Because if when you see it, it goes into your brain yeah. and through your eyes to the logical part of your brain. It's not the emotional right. story anymore. It now becomes a logical story that you can dissect and take apart and say, that doesn't make sense. That yeah. does. Why am I doing this? What's going on? By making those small changes, just that, you'll begin to start slicing off those parts of the elephant so that you can break it down and go, oh, this problem isn't as big as I thought. Right. I was looking at it through that magnification lens of anxiety, of depression, of burnout. Because burnout magnifies things a hundredfold, a thousandfold, depending on how burned out you are. And if you can just get 1% around that right. lens yeah. to see the teeny tiny little anthill that's actually there, you're like, oh, I guess that's not Mount Kilimanjaro. Oh, okay. It's not as big as I thought. And that's what it takes. Yeah. And I'll do the math for the people that are listening right now. You make a 1% change every day over 100 mm -hmm. days. You've just made a 100% change. Like it doesn't get any bigger than that. Clint, we're going to yep. put in the notes to this all of the places to get in touch with you. But for the people that are driving and listening right now, tell them mm -hmm. one more time the website address if they want sure. more information. Yeah, you can find me at smallchangesbigimpact.net backslash info. And you can also find me again on Facebook and Instagram at small changes, big impact dot the number four and the letter U. I tried to make it as idiot proof as possible because Lord knows <laughs> I'm an idiot people like sometimes. me. Thank so. you for doing that for people like <laughs> for me. For people just like me too. Yeah. I know you have another client that you have that's coming in to yes. see you. So thank you for giving us a little bit of your time. Thank you for helping people eat the elephant one small bite at a time. <laughs> have a great day, man. Thank you. There it is. Clint put it right in your lap like you put it right in my lap. You can't fix it until you own it. And if you've gone through some really big challenges in life, like Clint's gone through, if you've handled some monumental problems, nothing is going to get different as long as you're pointing the finger at somebody else or at circumstances. If you will own your part of the problem and make some small changes like Clint, Clint recommends, you can actually start to fix it. And I hope this episode has been helpful for you. Some of you out there need some daily motivation. And for those of you who need that daily motivation, I provided it, I packaged it all together, I put it in a little PDF, and I'll give it to you totally free. It's available for the but faithful followers, we call them the unbeatable army around here. And if you want my unbeatable army survival guide, just simply join up. It's totally free at unbeatablearmy.com. I want to say thank you to the people that are tuned in each week on your favorite podcast platform. By the way, Stitcher listeners, your platform is about to go away, I think in the next couple of days. So if you haven't already done it and you're listening to this episode on Stitcher, why don't you go ahead and subscribe on YouTube or go ahead and follow us on Spotify or Audible or Apple Podcast or another podcast platform because Stitcher is shutting down and they're shutting down ASAP. So why don't you jump over and follow us somewhere else? And by the way, if you will follow us on social media, you're going to run into some other amazing people that are part of the unbeatable army people like our fan of the week for this week mark chitwood mark thank you for staying connected with us thank you for staying engaged with us on social media if you want to find mark and other people like him just look for us on all of the prominent social media platforms just search at unbeatable podcast tomorrow 
get up in the morning, take it out of your head and put it down on paper and decide one small, 1% change that you're going to make and do that the next day and the next day and the next day. And who knows, maybe small changes will become a big impact in your life like they have been in Clint's and a whole lot of other people. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you have a great week. See you right back here next time. God bless. Thank you.